just have to show that I will be in your just at first. I will listen to the second paper, and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Jessica Rosenberg, uh, who is Associate Professor in Literatures in English at Cornell University. Her research and teaching focus on the relationships between science and literature in early England, uh, as well, well, I understood, on the, uh, on the history of material text and media forms and the aesthetic or the aesthetic dimensions of everyday life. She's the author of uh, Botanical Poetics, Early Modern Plant Books, and the husbandry really, of uh, a very recent book last year. Um, in which she actually uh, manages to, to put into dialogue um, total and Shakespeare's sonnets in, in one of the chapters. And uh, she also published numerous articles on husbandry, hospitality, poetry, and plants. She's currently working on a book about uh, how small epistemic forms like maths, devices, recipes, and techniques shaped early modern comedy in everyday life. Uh, and I think that the working title is Shakespeare's Second Nature. Yes. Uh, so today you're going to, to talk to us about the small epistemic forms and not a toy, a trick, the work of scale in Shakespeare's know how. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a pleasure to follow that um, double act. Um, I'm going to begin with an anecdote or a, a little story about little things. Um, <clears throat> It's not quite. Okay. It's yeah. It's changing on my screen, but not on the projector. Are you showing it on the on the Zoom thing? Um, just. just we, we can just see the the screen the office. Yeah. Yeah. That often helps. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's an answer into the one. All right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, in the epistle to his 1576 translation of Levinus Lemnius's Touchstone of Complexions, not necessarily a text that we'll be returning to many times um, over the course of the conference, but um, Thomas Newton tells the story of a certain dapper fellow in the court of Alexander the Great, who performs a trick that Newton describes in the course of several sentences as a bravery and ostentation of his cunning, a vain trick and thriftless device, a practice knack and notable singularity, needless and frivolous trumperies, a peevish practice, and finally an unnecessary matayotechni. This fellow's singular skill consists in the ability to throw a chickpea that's the chickpea, um, <clears throat> through the eye of a needle from pretty distance off and that many times without any missing. In Newton's telling, the anecdote stands in for Alexander's opinion on all vain arts, foolish baubles, fantastical toys, and curious devices, an opinion that he confirms with the reward of only a bushel of chickpeas. So he should not lose the hoped fruit of that, his practiced knack and notable singularity. The ostensible purpose of Newton's example is less to shame that dapper fellow's vanity than it is to praise Alexander's judgment. As he concludes, the reward of a bushel of chickpeas <clears throat> was very fit to countervail such a peevish practice. The chickpeas countervail both in that they are a fitting counterweight to the value of this trick, namely small, and in that Alexander's performance of judgment resists or poses an opposite force to the vanity of the procedure. Acknowledging there's no useful end to that performance, Alexander provides him a bushel of means to continue to practice his knack. Both the example itself and the final term are drawn from Quintilian, 
where mataiotechnia or vain art comes third in a series of Greek terms for rhetorical abuse, following non-art, a-technia, and bad art, kakatechnia. The example will reappear in other settings. Just a few years after Newton's translation in Montaigne's essay of Bain's subtleties or subtle devices, that's the title Florio gives it in translation. Um, there, the chickpeas have changed to grains of millet and Alexander has disappeared. Much later in Hegel's aesthetics, the anecdote reappears again, this time with a lentil, um, as a figure for mere copying. And this dapper fellow also makes a more recent appearance in C.M. Nye's theory of the gimmick. Um, the gimmick, which is in her account, another small form of questionable value, one that also links comedy and know-how. For Nye, Montaigne's account of the scene helps convey the non-systematic badness of the early modern proto-gimmick. The example is a lot like a gimmick, Nye argues, but not quite. It matters, she suggests, that this language of aesthetic judgment does not yet exist. Newton's translation, though, with its peevish practice and curious device and practice knack, gives us a sense of just how dispersed and copious the period's language for this kind of judgment was. Now, I begin with this example um, because of what the Dapper Fellows practice knack can tell us about what this kind of small form can do, not despite its smallness, but because of it. Um, <clears throat> though it be little, it's fierce um, in its own way. It can itself be a practice, a kind of know-how, an instinct, but it can also be an object and an offering, however small, um, a thing of value. Its value, though, emerges in repetition, in the iterative rhythms of performance. It's one chickpea after another after another. Like many subjects of early modern comedy, Newton's Dapper Fellow makes an aesthetic experience out of technology or technique. And the magic of that technique plays likewise on scale. And how many of us wondered in hearing this example just how small the chickpea or how large the needle must have been um, for this to work. In the larger project from which this talk is drawn, I consider the terms trick, knack, and device as an ensemble, as they operate in comedy and as they signify in other practical genres, in recipes, regimens, books of secrets, household advice. I've come to call these small epistemic forms, minimal units of know-how that helped fill out a language with which people could talk about the value of household goods, tactics of everyday practice, and the lineaments of style. At the moment, and I'll run through these quickly, but I have three basic hypotheses about how knack, trick, and device operate on stage and in everyday life. The first of those um, <clears throat> is that all three terms live on the boundary of work and thing of action and object. Um, the second, all three attract and signal crises of judgment, um, both in judging where one begins and ends and in judging what they're actually worth. Um, and three, and I'll be giving this one slightly short shrift today, but I would be happy to talk about it more. All three terms name a property characteristic of an individual or kind. So like the trick of the eye, right? It has the trick of it. Um, it's a minimal criterion for identification and distinction for telling things apart. Um, <clears throat> so the first of these points, um, each, each term stands for an objectified technique or an artifact. A knack could be a device or an artifice, a sense that survives mostly for us in knick-knack in English or an edible dainty, um, a toy or a trinket. A trick could be a ruse or a method or a trinket or a trifle. Device possesses especially daunting conceptual range with the capacity to name anything contrived or designed, whether a mechanical engine or a personal motto. Although, and with special force in the cases of trick and knack, and I think that's partially their force as syllables, um, implied a small and graspable form. This compactness underwrites the value of knacks in one early printed book of household secrets, the one that you can see the title page up, up on the screen here. Um, this collects, it, argue, it advertises many proper knacks to repast the minds of them that love new fangles. This is 1545. Uh, with its printed title surrounded by a border of single spot ornaments three layers deep, the title page is a pretty conceit that frames the book itself as a knack or a new fangle. The collection's pretty conceits and proper knacks range from everyday skills and labor-saving techniques to leisure demand and do-it-yourself marble. Marbles, not marbles. There are no marbles. 
as I remember, um, how to catch or kill mice, rice, lats, ma mice, rice, mice, lice, rats, and please, how to make that no dogs bark at you, how to know if a woman be with male or female child, how to make hair grow, how to make hair not grow. Um, if you've read books like these, you know where it's going next. Um, but books like these also offered knacks for making knacks, like the fine knacks that you might mold from sugar in the form of fruit. These knacks are both methods and small trifles as discrete units of action and as objects of social and commercial value. Knack also carries this double valence when it appears later in that same decade in Thomas Chaloner's translation of Praise of Folly. And I actually added this example back in after Joanne's paper um, yesterday. Um, and here again, this is in the context of banqueting. Um, and in Chaloner's translation here, he writes, so for what else, what booted so many junkets, sweetmeats, and dainties to balance the belly withal, unless the eyes, the ears, and the whole mind were also fed with laughter, sport, and merry conceits. But of all such knacks, I am the only divisor. Um, <clears throat> as Chaloner's use of device and divisor here makes clear, these knacks are made things and artifacts, but they're also closely tied to hospitality hospitality and consumption. Knack here is translating tragamata, originally a Greek word for like the sweet little fruits that you eat after dinner. Um, they're both a thing that you can do, but also a little consumable um, sweet meat. As the 16th century progressed, knacks and tricks as a language of objectified technique became part of Elizabethan comedy's reflect reflexive aesthetic language, how comedies accounted for the kind of thing that they were. This is reflected in a group of plays with titles like An Act to Know a Knave, which is 1594, An Act to Know an Honest Man, 1596, as well as A Trick to Catch the Old One, A New Way to Pay Old Debts, A New Trick to Cheat the Devil, etc. As proper names, these titles perform a trick of their own, condensing the rangy complexity of dramatic action into a graspable and possessable form. Part of the magic and pleasure of these titles follows from this efficiency of scale in their continuity with household goods as knickknacks, and in the density of their sound, the names of the trick and the knack capture this especially well. As synecdoche, a play that is a knack, promises knacks within, the titular trick is a model, a lesson in miniature and a demonstration. Its very structure suggests emulation. Alexander's countervailing reward of the chickpea slightly recognizes the cyclical temporality of this kind of practice. The chickpea trick wins ever more chickpeas. But the tricks and knacks that entitle these early modern comedies further promise that their material form represents something of value in itself. And that's usually one that turns on the revelation, revelation of technique. Like books of household practice, they offer their consumers secret useful knowledge and the possibility of repeating that knowledge outside the bounds of book or theater. And the slide that I have up right now actually shows two plays and one pamphlet, the pamphlet entitled The Trial of True Friendship or The Perfect Mirror, whereby to discern a trusty friend from a flattering parasite um, <clears throat> continues to be news you can use, um, but it seems to allude to these two plays. Um, so the two plays are 1594 and 1596, the pamphlet is 1596. Um, <clears throat> And it comes with the subtitle, otherwise a knack to know a knave from an honest man by a perfect mirror of both, soothly to say, try or you trust, believe no man rashly, no less profitable in observing than pleasant in reading. Um, and in Valentine Sims' edition, the word knack actually doesn't appear in the body of the pamphlet, it only on the title page and again in the header at the beginning of the text, which suggests that it may well be Sims himself, of course a publisher of drama at the same time, um, who in imagining the text as a sellable commodity introduced the theatrical allusion to these knacks. So the second of my three points becomes more clear in any of the comedies that I've just mentioned, that all three of these terms attract a crisis of judgment of both perception of the knack or the trick and evaluation. How can you tell when a trick is nearby, where it begins and ends, and how can you tell what it's worth? Increasingly, by the end of the century, to call something a knack or a trick might either advertise or devalue it, often by means of demystifying it. And to jump briefly to a slightly less comic context, um, the work of demystification is displayed nicely in the page layout of Reginald Scott's Discovery of Witchcraft, 
where here the judgment of NACs, especially juggling NACs, those fraudulent devices um, that are passing as magic, um, those judgments occur in the margins of the text in Roman type against the black letter of the main body of the text. Um, here, the recurrences of the term NAC only in the margins lineate the text superstructures of judgment and in classification. They sort of inframe and entrap it. To call something a knack or a trick disenchants the art it names by unveiling the instrument of its operation. But it also pres preserves that procedure for reuse and restoration. A potential realized decades later in the reuse of Scott's knacks without the judgmental commentary in the magic handbook Hocus Pocus Jr. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite titles. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So I'm going to spend the, the remaining part of this talk serving a few Shakespearean examples. Um, Shakespeare, it seems to me, is especially interested in the work that this lexical cluster performs to make courses of action intelligible on stage as discrete entities, as component but relatively autonomous pieces of, of a narrative series, bounded units with a beginning and an end, never fully subsumed under the intention, action, or labor of their divisor. Um, that is, they have kind of their own being um, as a sort of objectified action on stage. Shakespeare saturates words like device and trick with anticipation and suspicion. And I'll be going through a few um, examples from Twelfth Night here, and I've just got, got them up here for, for reference. Um, <clears throat> I smell a device, um, as Sir Toby Belch says, as he senses Mariah's plans for gulling Malvolio. He's echoed in The Winter's Tale by Autolycus's assessment of Florizel's clothes switching scheme when he says, I smell the trick on it. Smelling is an especially important sense for this, including like, you might think of smelling a rat just tied to these. Um, <clears throat> but even before they've ripened then, these tricks have an ontology. They're earthy and thingly enough to give off a whiff. As expressions of aesthetic and social judgment, these claims assert the judgment of the speaker, usually in shouting distance of someone else who has failed to perceive that same trick. These tussles over discerning a trick, who does, who doesn't, who does but only too late, power a great deal of comic business. We might compare two other tr tricks in Twelfth Night, the forged letter that tells Malvolio to put thyself into the trick of singularity, or the dances that Sir Andrew Aguecheek has ostensibly learned saying, and I think I have the back trick simply as strong as any man in Illyria. Though these are very different tricks, they nonetheless, we might say, share a trick. An accidental dirty joke, the comedy of Sir Andrew's back trick springs from blindness to his own double entendre, an ailment from which Mariah and Toby, as maker and smeller of devices, do not suffer. In both tricks, Malvolio and Andrew betray themselves with at best partial knowledge of what they in fact reveal in using the very word trick. This is a basic structure of comic deceit, of course, but I want to point out how the playtext relies on the doubled or tripled language of tricking for this effect. Both characters are hoodwinked by tricks multiplicity. It is as both hear it, a manner, a skill, or a device. It is also a trick on, a practice on each of them. Part of the comic pleasure produced here, I think, lies in its radical condensation in that single syllable of trick as a smallest sufficient unit for this complex work of social and epistemic discernment. What kinds of things then were these small forms of comic knowing? How autonomous are those devices from the figures who use them to make them smellable? Are they work performed by the bodies and minds of characters or are they independent objects or engines unfolding their own universe of consequences? This is something I think Shakespeare is very interested in. Um, I want to consider for a moment the metaphorical registers in which characters frame these tricks as a way to begin answering that question. In Twelfth Night, Mariah posits the gulling of Malvolio as a medical intervention. I know my physic will work with him. As she has implied a moment earlier, her physic, like all physic, works on a patient's complexion. And on that vice in him will my revenge find notable cause to work. As Jason Scott Warren has argued, the gulling of Malvolio occurs at the intersection of the Johnsonian comedy of humors and public rituals of bear baiting and animal cruelty. Both cultural forms, Scott Warren suggests, depend on making visible the essence of a creature, vexing it to reveal its proper distinguishing qualities. And the device itself, I would add, depends on the extended temporality of its operation, the time it takes to ripen, 
As Mariah next instructs, I will plant you two and let the fool make a third where he shall find the letter, observe his construction of it for this night to bed and dream on the event. You have to wait for the device to ripen. Um, later, once the device is in motion, they account for its operation in similar terms. As Mariah asks, does it work upon him? Sir Toby answers like Aquavitae with a midwife. Later, the device is an infection that works on Malvolio's constitution, one that might take air and taint. In these cases, the device is not so much a thing or a material contrivance as it is a complex operation that works through the body of the patient, the material of the medicine, and the skill of the divisor. And in turn, it is this relative autonomy from the labor of the creator that allows the NACRA device to accrue value. Relocated to a conversation between men, the medicinal virtue of Mariah's device is transmuted into material value. As Toby says to Andrew, I could marry this wench for this device and ask no other dowry with her but such another jest. The value of the jest, and thus of Mariah as jester and spouse, Sir Toby reveals, is the possibility of another one. Unlike a dowry of movable property, a device can't be accrued or hoarded. The reward for a jest is something like a barrel of chickpeas, another one and another one and another one. And I think there's some ambiguity here about Toby's phrasing. Um, is the proxy dowry just one more jest or is it actually a lifetime of jests? Um, I'm inclined to think the latter, which sort of switches marriage into like a subscription model, but that might be my own resentment of how everything now is switching to a subscription model that makes you continue to pay for it forever and ever and ever. Um, but the desire for another in either case um, suggests a sort of latent insufficiency in that single device. We need another. Um, <clears throat> Mariah's physic and Toby's nose, I think, also suggest a reading of the murder of Gonzago along similar lines. There, Hamlet's cry of wormwood registers the experience of bitterness, to be sure, um, but it also names the working of the mousetrap, another sort of small device, right, its operation. The virtues in the early modern pharmacological sense of the device as purgative, right, which is what wormwood is. Um, both Hamlet's and Mariah's schemes rely on skilled procedures presented as sequences of linked action, but both also imply a break between the labor of the character and the working of the scheme itself as a non-human locus of activity. Now, a longer version of this paper um, would track how Shakespeare layers and tangles these, wor these words across several plays. In Henry IV, part one, a play especially interested in tricking, I think, where the word appears quite a lot and where it's a capacity often linked so closely to Falstaff. He has the trick, the device, the starting pole up here. <clears throat> uh, but in that play, um, Shakespeare's language also gives equal weight to the third sense of trick as a mark by which identity might be discerned. And more precisely, a mark by which familial inheritance is betrayed. And we might we look there to Falstaff's jest on the villainous trick of Hal's eye as he's playing at the king. Um, Worcester's reference to the fox-like wild trick of the Percy's. And of course, much of the play's drama falls precisely at the tense intersection between those kinds of tricking, between the Falstaffian capacity to invent ever more tricks and the inexorable trick of ancestry to mark, discern, and sort. It's very much what that play is about. A longer paper might also track this constellation across the winter's tale. Um, another play that is not strictly a comedy, but where I think the work of this language is saying something about the place of the comic. Um, it is a play in which knacks and tricks are consistently underestimated and misjudged. Um, in Act 4, Scene 4, in particular, the long sheep shearing scene is where you get the greatest density of this cluster of terms. There, the disguised Calixenes tells Florizel he would load his she with knacks, right? The kinds of things he would buy from Autolycus. And I think he's echoing somewhat there what Aegeus says at the beginning of Midsummer, and I'm rethinking this now in light of, of Hermia. Um, but that his accusation that Lysander has enchanted Hermia with knacks and sweetmeats of strong prevailment, that she's been sort of a small thing, like overwhelmed by the small things that he's been loading her with. Um, but moments later, after this, um, Polixenes has made Perdita herself a knack, um, as well as a fresh piece of excellent witchcraft and an enchantment as he turns in that moment. Um, and 
in the winter style, I think this is especially fascinating, and I'm just going to end on this point, but that all of these earlier knacks and tricks are foils, and especially through Act 4, Scene 4, for the big trick of Act 5. Um, a notable singularity that staves off sort of both the countervalence of Alexander the Great's judgment or the demystification of Reginald Scott, right? It never gets demystified, the big trick of the end of the play um, of the statue coming to life. Um, and the language of trick, knack, and device, one that I think is limited to the comic spaces of the play, doesn't enter there. We get instead the language of grace um, at the end. So I will end on that. University of Toulouse. <laughs> so, Charlene, our next two speakers are, left, are going to be speaking on the same subject. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of them first. Okay, Estelle Rivière Arnaud, a professor at the University of Grenoble Alpes on études sur Vèze, anglophone, excuse me. Sa recherche porte sur l'adaptation scénographique du théâtre de la première modernité, ainsi que des, sur des réécritures contemporaines. Elle a publié plusieurs monographies et des collections d'articles à ce sujet, ainsi que des articles et des comptes rendus de mise en scène. Elle travaille actuellement une publication scénariste édition sur la réinvention de Hamlet au XXe siècle. Et um, Sébastien Scarpa est maître de conférence à la même université, à l'Université de Grenoble, où il enseigne la littérature, l'esthétique et l'histoire des idées au sein de département de la de Ses travaux portent principalement -moi, sur la poésie et la peinture britannique au 18e et 19e siècle. Il interroge l'essence du geste créateur et ses modalités de déploiement. Entre autres ouvrages, il a fait paraître un numéro de la revue Representations dans le monde anglophone consacré au détail de février 2021. Et le titre de leur communication est Fusilier ou Fusselier l'art de donner à voix le presque rien shakespearien. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, merci à vous pour la présentation, merci pour l'accueil et merci d'être là pour nous écouter. Alors avant de commencer, je souhaite préciser que cette communication sera plurielle, à plus d'un titre. C'est une communication à deux voix d'évidence, portant sur deux artistes puissants de deux siècles différents. Euh, une communication euh, également à la croisée des disciplines et des approches, l'approche picturale, l'approche théâtrale, l'approche textuelle également. Et enfin, une communication dont l'objet est un petit rien, un détail pris dans l'enchevêtrement de tout ce qui vient d'énoncer. C'est dire si nous avons beaucoup à dire. C'est dire si nous aurons du mal à tout dire. Donc, euh, voilà, on, a, on va opérer des, des coupes drastiques. On espère aller au bout. On a le temps, d'accord On me souffre que nous avons le temps à ma droite. Tant mieux. Donc, je, je m'empresse de commencer pour euh, vous rappeler, en réalité, ce que vous savez probablement déjà, à savoir que euh, Fius, d'ailleurs, artiste suisse, mais londonien d'adoption, est connu pour être le peintre du cauchemar. En d'autres termes, le peintre de l'inconscient qui fait irruption dans l'univers de la représentation. Le tableau fait sa renommée dès sa première exposition en 1782. Il en peindra plusieurs versions, comme celle-ci par exemple, et l'une des lectures qui en a été proposée consiste à y déceler un substrat shakespearien. Le monstre, la cube a priori, qui est acquis sur la poitrine de la jeune femme, serait une allusion à Queen Mary et le tableau inspiré d'une un, tirade de Mercutio dans Roméo et Juliette, actuellement c'est une L'analyse est parfaitement plausible. Les éléments du texte et de la toile coïncident et elle est d'autant plus plausible que Kiesling a peint un, un autre tableau, celui-ci intitulé Queen Mary, qui, on le voit bien, est le pendant 
visuel, les cauchemars, il en respecte les codes. En réalité, Philippe Sebeni euh, se passionne pour Shakespeare depuis son adolescence. Il y est invité par euh, son professeur, un professeur très charismatique à la faculté de théologie de Zurich, professeur Borgman, que l'on voit à l'écran, où deux converses de part et d'autre d'un buste d'Homère, qui surgit un petit peu à la manière du cheval dans le cauchemar. Euh, ensuite vient l'exil le, de Londonien, en 1764, il s'installe à Londres, il fréquente très assidûment les théâtres pour y voir des pièces de Shakespeare qui sont jouées. Et en 1789, il, euh, il expose à la Shakespeare Gallery et ses toiles y sont euh, très remarquées. Au point que les, la critique va euh, le consacrer Shakespeare Spina, le peintre euh, qui est jugé le meilleur illustrateur des pièces du Bard celui que l'on juge le plus apte à capter l'intensité esthétique et intellectuelle qui les caractérise. Donc de très nombreux tableaux de Fiusley émanent de l'univers shakespearien, j'en montre quelques-uns, Titania Van Borten, par exemple, qui est une toile foisonnante, fourmillante, j'insiste un petit peu sur ce terme, fourmillante, c'est une toile au plus vieux les détails euh, et qui trouve sa source, bien sûr, dans le sens de nuit d'été. Il y a quelques détails sur lesquels je reviendrai peut-être. Je souhaite également montrer cette autre toile, Macbeth Sleep Walking. Euh, C'est une toile qui nous propose un portrait saisissant d'une Lady Macbeth emportée par son délire dans l'acte 5, 5, scène 1. Ses yeux exorbités, semblables à ceux du cheval spectral dans le cauchemar, traduisent l'effroi tout autant qu'il méduse, et encore une fois j'insiste sur ce terme, puisqu'il évoque bien évidemment la méduse. Sa posture a quelque chose d'extrême, euh, son corps tendu, prolongé par la chandelle, et surgissant, encore une fois. Euh... <rire> De quoi Lady Macbeth souffre-t-elle exa exactement Qu'a-t-elle vu de si terrible Vers quoi s'emporte-t-elle Le médecin lui-même, figure archétypale de la connaissance rationnelle, et qui se tient en retrait dans ce tableau, ne peut répondre « This is beyond my practice », dit-il à ce moment-là de la pièce. Lady Macbeth s'emporte, elle s'avance vers le premier plan, elle s'approche de nous, qui nous situons hors ce hors-cadre qu'elle semble d'ailleurs désigner de son index. Par ce geste de monstration, elle nous oriente vers une autre toile de Fiusley, celle également célèbre des trois sorcières, The Three Witches, qui hante la même tragédie. Elles aussi sont monstrueuses et elles aussi font ce geste déictique et pour reprendre une, une formule célèbre, je propose d'écouter ce que leur pauvre mère raconte. « Speak if you can », les exhorte Macbeth. Dans la pièce, les trois sorcières produisent des signifiants abscons. « In perfect speakers », selon Macbeth lui-même, elle parle, mais reste muette dans le même mouvement. Sur la toile, leur doigt, ceux qui touchent leurs lèvres évoquent des langues pendantes, tout autant qu'ils invitent à se taire. Tandis que ceux de leur main gauche, leur main sinistre donc, s'agitent pour former un amas de phalanges assimilable aux pattes de quelque insecte étrange. Oui, un insecte comme la phalène que l'on distingue à peine dans la noirceur, donc juste au-dessus de leurs mains, une sorte de bougée subreptice repérée dans les mailles du texte pictural, un mouvement fugace presque imperceptible décelé dans l'opacité du tableau. Ce papillon, apparaissant et disparaissant à la fois, est un insecte rare, c'est un sphinx sept tête de mort, un atropos, c'est son nom scientifique, sur lequel il faudrait que je puisse m'étendre, j'en aurais pas le temps, mais... Euh, je voudrais m'étendre sur ce papillon, d'abord parce que euh, Atropos, c'est le nom d'une des trois parcs dans la mythologie grecque. La plus âgée, celle qui coupe le fil de la destinée, 
Et d'autre part, Fius Lake, qui se passionnait pour l'anthropologie, semble avoir cherché à mettre la main sur ce papillon toute sa vie avec obsession. Mais il s'agit avant tout ici, pour ce qui nous intéresse, d'un piège à regard. Il n'est pas sans évoquer un autre domaine pour moi, celui euh, anamorphique, les ambassadeurs de Hans Holbein, Quel quelque chose, un je ne sais quoi, presque rien en réalité, se suggère et mobilise le regard. C'est cela le détail, un insecte à l'échelle de l'œuvre globale. Insecte du latin insectum, soit ce qui est coupé. Détail du verbe détailler qui signifie couper en morceaux. Or, les tableaux de Fius, mais surtout ceux qui renvoient à une énergie expérience, regorgent de ce genre de détails que sont les insectes. C'est le cas des Slaves 16, c'est le cas de Titania Lenportum, comme vous l'avez vu, c'est le cas de Kouima, vous avez sans doute remarqué les papillons, c'est le cas de Pock, voilà quelques capture d'écran encore une fois. C'est le cas très intéressant de The Infant Shakespeare Between Tragedy and Comedy, je pourrais peut-être y revenir tout à l'heure. Et c'est le cas de ce tableau-ci, Beatrice Eavesdropping on Hero and Ursula. C'est mm -hmm. cette dernière œuvre qui va nous intéresser plus particulièrement. Ici se trouve le, le papillon pour le parler, et le voici ici, en gros plan. Que signifie la présence de ce papillon posé sur la robe de Béatrice Il n'est pas là par hasard, puis se l'est y a placé à dessein. Daniel Arras, dans son histoire rapprochée de la peinture et dans On n'y voit rien, a écrit des pages remarquables sur l'escargot qui se trouve dans cette toile de Francesco del Cronsa. Il y explique que le détail incongru sert à minima une double fonction dans l'économie de l'œuvre, une fonction symbolique et une fonction structurelle. En quoi le papillon fusélien renvoie-t-il à l'univers de Shakespeare et à Mathieu de Le Bernard en particulier Que symbolise-t-il et surtout nous renseigne-t-il de quelque manière sur une logique interne à l'œuvre Comme nous allons voir avec Estelle, le papillon suppose tout d'abord un bestiaire qui est effectivement présent dans l'œuvre, mais ses mouvements erratiques font aussi de lui le symbole de l'oscillation, de l'hésitation et de la trajectoire brisée, qui sont des notions clés de l'intrigue. Son organicité, deux ailes palpitant de part et d'autre à un axe central, suggère également la symétrie et la mise en regard d'éléments opposés. Ce sont alors les thèmes du double et du miroir qui émergent. Et enfin, ces métamorphoses, la chenille devient chrysalide, puis papillon aux ailes déployées, eh bien, ces métamorphoses signalent la possibilité d'une renaissance et d'un renouvellement au-delà de toute fixité, soit des attributs même du texte shakespearien, qui est un texte mouvant, en devenir constant parce que chargé de polysèmes, un texte au sein duquel le terme est en réalité un commencement, et où le sens particulièrement ductile, toujours s'inachève, en effet, de signifiance. Je termine pour dire que William Blake, contemporain et ami de Fils Lee, est l'auteur de cette formule célèbre, « To see a world in a grain of sand ». Je n'irai pas jusqu'à dire que nous allons voir « The whole world of Shakespeare » et « The butterfly », mais l'insecte détail opère certainement au-delà de sa forme aussi construite et au-delà de lui-même. Donc, on, il va revenir sur le détail du papillon. Alors, on va faire un petit détour, puisque ce qui nous intéressait aussi dans ce dialogue, c'est de pouvoir euh, relier euh, l'art de la composition picturale et l'art de la composition théâtrale, l'art du scénographique auquel je m'intéresse hein, souvent, et voir peut-être l'influence que Pussy a encore aujourd'hui sur certaines esthétiques théâtrales. Dans un premier temps, je vais revenir un peu sur la pièce, euh, tout comme sur la toile de Fius Lee, euh, où les détails s'estompent avec le temps, puisqu'on peut s'interroger aussi sur le fait que euh, les détails euh, disparaissent puisque la toile se noircit avec l'âge. Euh, le sens des mots de la pièce de Shakespeare est fluctuant, et ce, dès le titre. 
Nous sommes invités à chaque nouvelle lecture, chaque nouvelle représentation de l'œuvre sur la scène ou sur la toile à évaluer ses mots. Dans « Much Ado about Nothing and the Spectator », William Barbiola analyse l'ambivalence comme le principe même sur lequel le dramaturge a construit la pièce, je le cite, « The dramatist is making generalization difficult. There is always another interpretation available and it is usually just as valid. » Il avait, juste avant ce, cette conclusion, rappelé que le « nothing » titre de la pièce se prononçait « nothing » au XVIe siècle et qu'il renvoyait au terme euh, « homologue »,« observing » et « eavesdropping » que l'on trouve dans presque toutes les scènes de la pièce. L'une des principales thématiques de « Match Do » est en effet le regard, ce que se portent les personnages les uns aux autres, en même temps que l'écoute, attentive et secrète de ce que l'on dit d'eux. On le constate dès l'acte 1, lorsque Don Pedro propose à Claudio de jouer son rôle afin d'obtenir les œuvres de Hero lors de la fête qui est organisée par Leonardo. « I will assume thy part in some desires, and tell fair hero I am Claudio, and in a bosom I'll enclass my heart and take the hearing prisoner with the force and strong encounter » Of my Morris Tale, acte 1, scène 2, vers 300-400. Dans le dialogue entre Shakespeare et Fiusini, nous observons les sujets du tableau et les mots du texte pour déceler ce qu'ils dissimulent en nous accordant cependant sur l'improbable certitude qui en résultera. Car Much of You joue sur le fond semblant, Deception, terme qui vaut pour l'art pictural comme pour l'art théâtral, puisque dans ce dernier, le déguisement, Sky, euh, agit en maître, puis on l'a entendu dans l'exemple juste avant. La scène représentée sur le tableau de Piusi correspond à l'acte 3, scène 1, moment central de la pièce et souvent extrêmement divertissant dans ses représentations scéniques. Selon l'édition New Shakespeare, chez Cambridge, qui se réfère au quarto de la pièce, elle se déroule dans un verger, au milieu des rangées d'arbres fruitiers, Hero, Margaret Ursula sont censés piéger Beatrice. Les références à cet environnement abondent dès les premiers vers, où on entend Say that thou overheard us dans la voix de, par la voix de, de Hero, qui dit à Margaret qu'elle doit aller chercher Beatrice and bid her steal into the peachy bower where honeysuckles ripened by the sun forbid the sun to enter. C'est intéressant de voir que sur la toile, effectivement, le soleil semble absent. Les scénographies choisies pour cette scène recourent également souvent à une esthétique verdoyante, relevant tantôt du symbole, euh, on va le voir là-dedans, les euh, deux, euh, deux images suivantes. Donc, l'une qui a été euh, prise en, en 2016 au Festival de Shakespeare de Punta. Euh, et puis, parfois, euh, relativement réaliste dans le, la mise en scène en 2009, euh, oui, en pleine. Dans la dernière mise en scène au Globe, qui date de 2022, il y en aura une cet été aussi, en 2024, hein, l'ensemble du décor était revêtu de feuillage et de fausses pelouses. Sur la toile de Fiusi, cette nature est également présente, quoique de façon plus estompée, des personnages se situant à l'avant-scène occulte un peu la visibilité, la, la vue de, cette, de cet arrière-plan vers nous. Mais d'autres éléments du script y trouvent un écho saillant, trouvent un écho saillant sur la toile. Ainsi, la posture tout en courbe de la Béatrice du tableau se dessine dans les termes employés par celle de la pièce. Sous la plume de Shakespeare est en effet dépeint un bestiaire qui compare Béatrice à un vano, la pring, vers 24, puis à un poisson, ferré, puis plus tard comme un faucon, haggard. Plus loin, c'est aussi le terme « lined »,« she's lined euh, » au verset 104, qui fait plus encore penser aux lignes courbes du sujet de Fusey, car si l'ambivalence du terme « lime » renvoie à la fois à l'arbre, au tilleul, au fruit du verger, le citron vert et à l'oiseau capturé, c'est lorsqu'il traduit l'ondulation propre au mouvement d'une personne qui se prélasse fait en en résonance, texte, étoile. On note aussi sur le tableau, puisqu'on parle du bestiaire, la présence d'un chien 
euh, tout en haut, je ne sais plus s'il y a un détail euh, sur le tableau qu'on voit, voit, voilà, on voit qu'il est en train de boire dans une coupe. Euh, je vais passer assez vite sur ce détail-là, puisque ce qui nous intéresse, c'est quand même le papillon. Euh, le chien est mentionné plusieurs fois dans la pièce. Ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'il il est euh, mentionné en, par la, la voix de, de Béatrice et celle de Bénédicte quasi exclusivement. Une fois, il est, il est, euh, il est mentionné par Doc Berry, qui contient aussi le, le terme « chien dans » son, dans son nom. Euh, mais ce, ce rapport au chien est, lié, est, est toujours euh, relié à… à au rapport à la séduction, à la séduction ambivalente hein, et au, au fait que euh, c'est l'ambivalence est due à, à, à une voix déplaisante, comme un aboiement, une façon de se comporter qui serait assourdissante. Euh, on s'est beaucoup interrogé sur la présence et la fonction de ce, de ce chien euh, qui, dont on voit aussi un, un faible euh, une faible ligne rouge hein, qui tombe comme le vin euh, ou, ou peut-être euh, un, un fruit rouge qui, euh, qui est bu et qui semble couper la toile en deux, mais tout en la reliant aux, aux courbes de, du costume de Béatrice. Venons-en au papillon, il n'y a pas à proprement parler d'allusion au papillon dans la pièce, malgré toutes les allusions qu'il peut y avoir à d'autres insectes ou d'autres animaux. Mais Fusely nous donne des clés de lecture. Les points sur les ailes du papillon qui imitent les yeux du peintre et ceux admirant la toile sont aussi l'expression double. Or, on le sait, cet acte 3, scène, cet acte 3, scène 1 est le double, peut-être une forme de répétition de la scène 3 de l'acte 2, lorsque Bénédicte est lui aussi l'objet du complot amical de Don Pedro, Leonardo et Claudio. Dans cette scène, je passe assez rapidement, il y a aussi euh, des allusions répétitives euh, aux animaux, comme la volaille, la mouette, euh, ou encore le poisson, mais aussi à la façon de se, se, de se mouvoir euh, qu'a Bénédicte et qui reflète celle qui nous est présentée ici sur le tableau de Fusil. Euh, je, 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 re, je, je passe un petit peu certains détails pour, pour préciser encore que ce, ce papillon, porteur du double, porteur aussi de l'évanescent, quelque chose qui fluctue, qui bouge, euh, est, est porteur d'un ensemble de signifiants. Il est, on le voit sur la manche, les Béatrice posée délicatement sur un tissu rouge et paraît démesuré dans les proportions de, de, de la toile. Il s'impose aussi dans un endroit central du tableau, comme l'est la scène 1 de l'acte 3, lumière se dégageant de l'obscurité, tout comme le visage du sujet. Malgré tout, à l'instar de l'éventail que l'on voit sur la gauche, et qui est tenu par Hero, ou encore des plis du tissu de la robe de Béatrice, il évoque l'effleurement, la grâce, la féminité, des éléments qui ne sont pas présents pourtant dans la définition de, du comportement de Béatrice. Hero dit d'elle uh, « Nature never framed a woman's heart of prouder stuff than that of Béatrice. Disdain and scorn right sparking in her eyes, misprising what we look on. » Le papillon vient donc inscrire l'ironie aussi dans la composition. Il est intéressant dans la, la citation que je viens juste de porter, euh, de, de, de noter que c'est aussi un vocabulaire euh, lié au regard hein, qui est euh, utilisé, qui décrit la façon de regarder et qui, par ricochet, nous invite à regarder à notre tour sans dédain, cependant nous mépris les yeux des personnages euh, qu'a qu peint Fusley. On voit que chaque individu, chaque femme a les yeux en biais, coquins parfois, complices, inquisiteurs, et tous, en tout cas, louvoyants. Terme deux fois employé par Béatrice dans des expressions à l'acte de scène 1, pour parler d'abord de l'attitude de Bénédicte, « I'm sure he's in the fleet », puis de son propre cœur, « awful, it keeps on the wind side of 
Sur la toile du peintre, papillon, éventail, drapé, engage la scène d'observateur à revenir au texte, à y feuilleter de nouveau les pages pour déceler d'autres sens et mieux voir le détail contenu dans le verbe. Je passerai rapidement sur deux autres images scénographiques qui peut-être font très loin, de manière très lointaine écho à la toile de Fusli pour simplement, euh, alors dans un premier temps, c'est euh, sur l'image suivante, celle-ci, voilà la mise en scène que pu, euh, à laquelle j'ai pu assister en 2016, hein, 2007, euh, au Théâtre du Globe, alors euh, situé dans, dans le Mexique des années de, de la Révolution de 1910. Ce qui m'intéressait dans, dans, dans la plupart des images en fait, que nous pouvons tenir de cette mise en scène, ce sont les le déploiement des, des jupes qui euh, reprennent le motif de l'éventail et aussi de ce feuilleté que l'on peut avoir euh, au, au fil des pages lorsque l'on revient en avant, en arrière, sur euh, les mots du texte. Et puis, un deuxième motif, très présent aussi dans la toile de Fusli, mais qui est évidemment euh, un motif théâtral avant tout, c'est le rond. Le rond que l'on voit dans les yeux, dans les yeux à l'instant, que l'on voit aussi sur les points du papillon et qui évoque bien sûr le haut de bois. Euh, donc haut de bois, espace hein, supposé vide, mais qui est euh, espace en, en réalité plein de sens. Il faut guetter le signe, le laisser surgir et se laisser surprendre, comme avec la toile de Tussi. Ce haut de bois, c'est donc aussi l'œil du spectateur hein, qui attend le surgissement du sens à travers le signe, que ce soit devant la scène ou devant le tableau. On le voit ici dans ces différentes représentations. Il est effectivement plein, ce rond central, euh, ce cercle euh, géométrique qui, euh, où les personnages vont parler, vont apporter euh, des informations sur l'intrigue. Il est aussi présent dans la toile du tableau, euh, non seulement dans les yeux, à l'extrémité des feuillets de l'éventail, dans l'ovale du chapeau que porte Béatrice ou encore dans la courbure des corps. Il est ostensiblement présent dans ces scénographies, par mise en scène ici, euh, au Festival Lusa, dont j'ai déjà parlé, mais dans une autre mise en scène, euh, à chaque fois pour apporter un nouveau signifiant au cœur, euh, au centre du plateau. Ce haut, ce rond central, dirige donc notre regard, l'oriente vers cet espace clé. Il revêt la forme de l'œil pour mieux encore nous inviter à voir ce qu'il y a dedans, mais aussi autour, voire au-delà. Je repasse la parole pour conclure. Je vais conclure qui pour une minute trente. Oh, Je conclue sur euh, cette, euh, cette vignette pour. Euh faire un point sur le, le, le regard, la paire d'yeux dont Christelle vient de parler, et le, le papillon, là, vous voyez au centre, le papillon qui est un papillon pour moi visage, un papillon faciès. Les deux tâches, les deux ocelles sur l'aile du papillon lui donnent une consistance en mort. Cela veut dire que quelque chose, ou plutôt quelqu'un, me regarde. Et je me regarde en retour. Il est l'objet de ma pulsion scopique. Papillon regard indice une rencontre, une rencontre avec un autre, avec une altérité qui est tapie dans les profondeurs du tableau. Ce papillon est donc un objet de contact, de contact visuel. Tout le problème étant ici, qui nous est présenté comme fuyant, comme volatile, déjà disparaissant. Car le papillon est un être du battement, du spasme de la palpitation, du clignement pur et éphémère. Donc l'imago, qui est le nom scientifique du papillon, fait image, mais cette image est une parure. C'est un leurre qui masque la béance d'une non-rencontre, le vide creusé d'une rencontre impossible avec un être épanoui, intangible. Il se l'est passé beaucoup de temps à peindre ces papillons au cœur de ces toiles, il les bénit avec précision, ils sont nets, et euh, s'ils font l'objet d'une grande concentration, c'est parce qu'ils sont d'une intense activité pulsionnelle. Euh, ils sont nœuds, en quelque sorte, dans le, le, tissu, le tissu pictural, la trame de la représentation, la morture de la également. 
euh, est quelque chose d'essentiel, donc bien si, si signalé, mais ce, ce quelque chose d'essentiel est aussi fondamentalement évanescent. L'artiste aura beau faire, l'objet de son désir demeurera toujours « beyond this practice », comme dit le médecin dans euh, Macbeth. Euh, derrière le détail, donc, « nothing » ou « no thing » ou « no »« d'être thing » ou « no » je ne suis pas shakespearien, mais pourquoi pas. Donc la chose, pour dire les choses avec Lacan, c'est quelque chose qui demeure hors cadre, qui ne peut être représenté que par autre chose qu'elle-même, car pour le sujet désirant, elle occupe un espace qui est vide de signifiant. Je termine par une citation de Pascal Quignard qui écrit, je le cite, « Une image manque dans l'âme. » On appelle cette image qui manque l'origine. Nous la cherchons derrière tout ce que nous voyons. Les artistes, qu'ils soient peintres, poètes ou dramaturges, la cherchent au cœur de leur création sublimatoire, sur la toile, sur la page et sur le bout du nord. Merci beaucoup et merci pour le Merci beaucoup à tous les trois pour vous être dans le temps d'essayer de faire Merci Donc, il n'y a pas de there. Et donc, j'aimerais bien vous. Voilà. Merci à vous pour ces ce, ce deux communications. Ma question s'adresse à Alvarez. Euh, Est-ce que. On sait euh, comment se sont transmis ces petits bijoux, enfin, ces, ces miniatures, et à partir, disons, vers ma question, c'est à partir de quel moment ont-ils, sait-on, à partir de quel moment ils ont pu perdre de leur valeur euh, mm -hmm. relique, si on veut, ils ont atteint le marché de l'art, etc. Est-ce que c'est -ce est possible de le tracer Ou est-ce que, voilà, ma question, est-ce que c'est est des objets qu'on se transmettait de, de génération en génération pour euh, comme un mémento euh, mm -hmm. euh, C'est très difficile de le, de le savoir. On a très peu d'informations sur, sur ces petits objets. Il y en a très peu d'abord qui ont été conservés. Euh, leur, euh, ils apparaissent un petit peu avant le, le, les miniatures qui représentent Charles I et en particulier l'exécution, le, etc. Visiblement, ce ne sont pas les premiers exemples, ça commence un petit peu plus tôt, plutôt à titre de divertissement. On a aussi des exemples de, euh, de miniatures qui servaient plutôt euh, la, la moquerie ou la satire politique. On a notamment des, euh, des, des, des miniatures avec des euh, euh, ugly qui représentent euh, la vie du pape pour euh, le, le déposer sur le roi. On avait des, voilà, une version un petit peu satirique avant. Euh, la, 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 donc, il y a plusieurs états de l'objet. Il y a aussi ces miniatures de mode, plutôt. Euh, il est difficile de savoir comment elles circulaient. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on les trouve essentiellement donc, aux, aux Pays-Bas, en, en France, on appelle ça des miniatures à transformation. En France, euh, en, en Suède, euh, quelques-unes quelques en Angleterre également. Mais leur euh, trajet, leur histoire et leur voyage euh, restent très euh, méconnus. Euh, C'est vraiment quelque chose encore très euh, mystérieux, ce qui est un peu frustrant. Euh, mais on sait très peu de choses euh, et sur leur euh, valeur, je pense que d'un set à l'autre, on voit qu'il y, y, y a des qualités quand même assez différentes. Donc, je pense que ce serait difficile aussi de généraliser sur la, la, la valeur de ces objets. Je pense que ce pour, euh, pour Charles, euh, non, je ne préfère pas lancer d'hypothèse euh, sans, sans fondement. Je, je, on n'a pas de source vraiment, donc euh, malheureusement, je n'ai pas de réponse euh, précise à apporter. Merci beaucoup pour euh, les discussions euh, très intéressantes. J'adore Fuseli, mais ma, ma question est aussi pour Gohan Valéry. Um, I was very interested in what you were saying about the, these miniatures as taking on quite maximalist themes like history painting. And I wonder, is there any possibility that these miniatures are alluding in some way to the kinds of paintings in Charles' own art collection, which you know, is quite widely known and celebrated? Is that a possibility? Um, it's it's a very good question. I I I really don't know. The, the thing is, from from what the the sort of the um, rather um, lower quality of the portraits in 
particular. It seems that they've been made for um, commercial purposes initially. And I'm not too sure that we could sort of um, um, see any form of artistic gesture or, or reference. I'm, I'm not too sure about this, but it could be. Then again, we know so little about these uh, small pictures that it would be very difficult to see, but it's a, it's a, a really good idea, actually. Yeah. Since we've come back to this, the question of scale, um, I was wondering, could you just tell us this morning you spoke about figures, which means, could you just go back to the question of stature and say what is about how you represent someone who's um, tall or small in relationship to this, um, figuring forth this, the, the, the large and enlarging mm. Yeah. Um, in what the um, art of of, of limning says is uh, is is well, it's it's based upon a um, the uh, um, the rule of the eye mostly, which is a phrase used by Hilliard himself. Um, and um, in addition to um, sort of um, not really mathematical, but um, rules of proportions and, and sizes uh, by which Hilliard says that you'd recognize in a picture, you know, uh, you, you, you could tell a, 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 a tall man from a small man. Um, there's also um, a sort of um, habit or grammar of the, of, of the eye, which is sort of attuned to um, um, gauging proportions and sizes. So um, it's a sort of mixture of um, impression and calculation really um but the uh, the thing is that the conversation in um in Heliot street is is um not really representative of what he did because um sydney's question from what we know you know from what uh, the um the version that we have in in Heliot's text um is a comparison of two persons within the same two uh, figures within the same uh, picture um which doesn't happen in, in Hilliard's miniature. So it doesn't really apply to his own art of, of portraiture. But uh, what we can say is that it's probably something that he was um, um, interested in. And it's probably the reason why he started experimenting with experimenting sorry, with different formats. We uh, mentioned the um, um, full length miniature of Hatton this morning. And there's another one by uh, of um, Mildmay, uh, which also tries to sort of uh, give an impression of the, uh, the stature of the man. And for this, um, he would sometimes use a um, small object or creature, dogs in the case of the two uh, miniatures, which I've just mentioned, very small dogs to sort of um, um, allow the uh, the viewer to have a, a sort of um, measure, a form of, to be able to compare the size of the dog with the size of the man. But um, um, with stature, I guess perhaps the format of the miniature, the oval format helped as well. Moving from the um, uh, circle shape, the round shape to the oval shape helped give a better sense of proportion in shoulders, for example. So it helped a bit, I guess. Yeah, I too love very much to see, but again, my question is going to be for that. But again, you're talking so it's so fascinating, and I would so is that aware of these sense of objects. Um, I've seen um, miniature rings uh, representing, um, representing Charles the first, uh, but a different kind of metamorphosis, which is far more authentic. You mm -hmm. yeah, just have two options. Yeah. You see the precious stone and you see the king, mm -hmm. the one being the translation of the other. Yep. But uh, with these miniatures, you, all, you actually have the additional option of rewriting history and going backward in history. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe starting with the dead and restoring him back to his uh, glory, um, which is absolutely fascinating. And I was wondering um, how the um, how the little makeup uh, uh, pieces were were kept. Uh, did they uh, did they have a case of their own, a certain order? Um, because the, the portrait itself, okay, it came uh, mm -hmm. it came on the slides, but uh, uh, do we have actually a uh, a full case containing them all? Um, um, they were usually kept in the same boxes, in the same case as the portrait itself. I found, um, I've come across only one example of a picture um, that was kept um, underneath the sort of um, uh, glass lid and the um, the mica slips went underneath within the box. So it's the only example that I, but for this a specific example that the miniature was on vellum as well, not on carpet. So it's a slightly different kind of object. So mm -hmm. not sure it you know falls into the same category really. But for the for these sets that have um, 
been looking at um, they're all kept in the same box which is also partly the reason why they were so damaged um, also because you know they were just um, on top of each other really and um, sometimes you get um, um, mica overlays from other sets um, in another box in uh, one of the um, cases with um, a miniature of Charles the first you have three or four slips I think um, clearly belonging to a um, another set with a female sitter. The slips are, are far um, smaller and the type of costumes that you have. So um, they were played with and, you know, they were just all kept in the same box and uh, there is nothing regarding their order, which is fascinating because, you know, it's... Depending on how you how you use the, uh, yeah. the lockets, I mean, if you use them as an object of devotion or a memorabilia in your, in your own home, maybe Completely. you can them on your table yeah. or... Uh, changing them each day. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> True. Yeah, there's really a, a dimension of agency, you know, you know, which is why they're they're so fascinating and you know how they how they're playable. Yeah. The viewer to actually mm -hmm. rewrite history. Exactly. And there's even some of the uh, overlays which are very hard to um to to describe as some episodes which are very um. Uh, unclear on some you know overlays it's very difficult to determine what it was supposed to represent which moment exactly in a trial or execution or you know um imprisonment so it's not always very clear um the the order is only ever putative you can never be sure of the order you could use which mm -hmm. makes them even um more interesting because as you said you can you know um, play history in reverse order or you know jump episode and pretend you know he was never executed in the end and um so uh yeah the, the, they're very, um, um, well, again, interesting for this. Uh, I just wanted to use the, I just wanted to ask a question, Sebastian and Estelle. En fait, uh, on parle de miniature, le petit et le grand. En fait, le presque rien, c'est pas, c'est pas une, une taille, en fait. Et, um, et donc, est-ce que, you deal. Can you tell us in a way what you know the presque rien is in relation to our discussion of the small and the big, the miniature and the the large? You talked about it, and I think the I think the um, the idea of taking something that we can't see in Shakespeare and making it a butterfly. Um, it's very Nabokian. I mean, Nabokka was fascinated yeah, with so with uh, with butterflies, and so I I really think that this is a very interesting idea. It's presque rien, and I just that says merci beaucoup. I don't know if I have to answer in English or in French. Well, if you can answer in English, you'd be yes, more yes. comfortable. Uh, we really thought about the. We have not really focused on 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 this in in our presentation, but we we tried to link the nothing of the title and the and the well the meaning of the nothing, uh, which of course the translation in French is is useful for our uh, pun on presque rien, which is or yeah which is um, which we can really see in the picture something that is almost nothing that means so much um so yes about the, the size yeah. we just saw that well after well we, we thought about the the proportion of the of the butterfly which is which seems really big on the, on the canvas um and that but that the meaning was beyond just the size it's not just a question it's just a matter of size it's also uh, what it reflects, what the, the abstraction it represents, um, the meaning which is Eden. Uh, and I think Sebastian has, has more to say about this butterfly, but yeah, we, don't, we didn't really think in terms of scale, really, more about the, um, the unconscious uh, uh, gesture of the artist behind uh, the representation. Well, to me, the Pascal uh, Young is not a thing I say. It is, let's say, something, uh, a, a, 
a site or a space rather than an object. Um, in fact, a space within the human psyche devoid of signifiers. So if it is devoid of signifiers, it can only be it can only be represented through its own negation by something else that you know covers over. So it, it, it's it's and the subject other than the moon sphere. You call someone to call someone you know very well. <laughs> it's 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 just there in passing. It indicates that there is more beyond the image. Mm -hmm. That the image is not the the, the thing in question. Mm -hmm. What I meant by Pascal it is there, it catches your attention. But you but linked it, there. you linked it to a butterfly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so but, but, I mean it is the, linked the, to the a word, butterfly. The, the word <laughs> butterfly, there's, there's another word that I said for a butterfly. Imago. Ah, mais bien. Image. Right. It is an image, but the image of what? Mm -hmm. The question's raised. Okay. Let me see. Um, should I ask a question? Um, yeah, you, you said the the image. You just said the image of what? And I, but I, I'd like to ask that question on on, um, on an even uh, more basic level. I sometimes have trouble um, identifying. Well, you said you said what the details were, but sometimes they look like something else to me, mm -hmm. uh, like the um, uh, fan. But they were playing cards. Mm -hmm. uh, I um, the um, the uh, the eyes on the butterfly um, look like cufflinks, <laughs> uh, and and that happens a lot. And I'm wondering if it's just that I can't like see very well. I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe I have like the fancy. I don't know. Uh, but I'm wondering. But it does seem kind of relevant uh, that the fan looks not just like the butterfly, but also like playing cards. Tricking her and all that, and I'm wondering if all if that's also maybe the point of all that thickness that kind of makes perception uh, difficult. At least I, I found uh, perception a little bit difficult, and I kept seeing several different details that weren't necessarily uh, what they actually are in the in the scene. So I'm wondering whether there isn't a uh, hallucinatory uh, quality, but also perhaps options. Um, and different interpretations carried by the, oh, the objects. Thank you very much. This is very typical of the future is style, the, the, the chiaroscuro technique means that certain things are supposed to be appear, become manifest, but it's hard to say what they are because part of them uh, recede in the background, so to speak. Uh, that was interesting what you said about the, the fan. In fact, uh, you can fold it, unfold it, the landscape, an entire landscape can, can appear to you. And at the same time, you can hide yourself behind, behind the fan. So it's the whole trick. Certain things become manifest, they're shown to us to attract our gaze, but they hide mm -hmm. other things. Oh, even more relevant. Well, I think that, um, well, we will continue. I think it's time if you have any more questions. So we have a pause now. And thank you so much. Thank you. Please give a warm thank you. No, no break. No, no break. We're going, We're going right up to the next panel, folks. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here um, for the final panel of the day called Remain. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dipna Callahan, um, who is the University Professor and William L. Safir Professor at Syracuse University. Um, Dipna has been 
the shortest, most modest biog I've probably ever seen. She describes herself as written, having written several books, <laughs> which is somewhat of an understatement given her impact on Shakespeare, women in the early modern period and feminism. Um, I do have to particularly mention um, her most recent book on reading Shakespeare's poetry, which I'll be buying on Amazon as soon as the panel is finished. Um, uh, so over to Dipna. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, before we start, I just I, I just point out the the figure that I'm going to be talking about, uh, perhaps in violation of the conference description. Is this one up here on the right? The the little fella up there, the corner. <laughs> Can you hear me on this? Yes. Okay. Linda Nocklin's assertion that the fragment is a metaphor of modernity is now all but axiomatic among art historians. However, the same might also be said of Shakespeare's world, where the overwhelming experience of art in early modern England was of shattered objects, of artifacts damaged, despoiled, in the midst of the iconophobia unleashed by the Protestant Reformation. This historical circumstance, I will argue, is key to the depiction of visual culture in Shakespeare and to the strategies of theatrical and poetic representation deployed there. Approaching Shakespeare's rendition of visual art from the perspective of the partial and the fragmentary results in a radically altered understanding of the concept of representation. For Shakespeare has been taken to represent life as a plausible totality. And to this view, Hamlet's instruction to the players to hold the mirror up to nature has been untiringly adduced as evidence. Yet as the call for papers for this conference reminded us, there is in Shakespeare an issue of scale, quote, a fine balance between the very large and the very small, unquote. It is this relationship I ten intend to probe today via Shakespeare's image of the Colossus of Rhodes in Antony and Cleopatra, renowned not only or even primarily for its size, this statue was ma mainly famous for having, by oracular decree, lain in pieces for nearly a thousand years. In the early modern imagination, then, the Colossus was always already in pieces, while simultaneously its detritus invariably suggested its former unbroken magnitude, raising issues of size, dimension and scale, as well as the relation between fragmented materiality and meaning. Oh, that didn't work. I wonder why. Well, never mind. Okay. His legs bestrid the ocean. His reared arm crested the world. Built to celebrate the ending of the Macedonian siege in 305 BC, the gigantic bronze statue, estimated to have been about 110 feet tall, depicted the Greek sun god Helios and straddled the entrance to Rhodes Harbour, which would have made its leg span about 1,300 feet. Philo of Byzantium observed, the artist expended as much bronze on it seemed likely to create a dearth in the mines, for the casting of the statue was an operation in which the bronze industry of the whole world was concerned, unquote. Its magnificent erected form, described in England's Parnassus 1600, that colossus reared up in rows, unquote, was described in Philemon Holland's 1601 translation of Pliny the Elder's Natural History as, quote, calling for admiration before all others, the colossal statue of the sun at Rhodes, made by Charles of Lindos, pupil of Ly Lysippus. The statue was seven cubits high. It is recorded that it took 12 years to complete. However, it fell victim to an earthquake in 226 BC, 56 years after its erection. As Strabo's geography records, the Colossus of Helios now lies on the ground, having been thrown down by an earthquake and broken at the knees. In accordance with a certain oracle, the people did not raise it again, unquote. Thus, most early modern references are to the fallen statue, revealed as the brittle carapace of a former victory, which remained until 1654 AD, when Rhodes was conquered by the Arabs. The monument ransacked for its bronze, which was then sent to Syria. Pliny reports, quote, it was overthrown by an earthquake, but even lying on the ground, it is a marvel. Few people can make their arms meet around the thumb of the figure, and the fingers are larger than most statues. 
Writing in 1600, Robert Ollett reports, Colossians are denominated for the great Colossus in Rhodes, a statue of brass being at once one of the world's seven wonders. While the statue was thus designated in antiquity, Stabo reports, this then is the most excellent of the votive offerings. At any rate, it is by common agreement one of the seven wonders, unquote. It was only in the Renaissance, when there was renewed interest in lists and other forms of collection, that the conception was fully realized. The Dutch painter Martin van Heemskriek made a series of widely circulated engravings of the seven wonders and the painting that I began with, which included the Colossus and the Great Pyramids at Giza. Like the Colossus, Antony's literally gigantic proportions dwarf the miniature terrestrial realm. But what specifically identifies him as the Colossus of Rhodes is that his legs bestrid the ocean. His face was as the heavens and therein struck a sun and moon which kept their course and lighted the little O of the earth, most sovereign creature. His legs bestrid the ocean, his reared arm crested the world, his voice was propertied as all the tuned spheres and that friends but when he meant to quail and shake the orb, he was as rattling thunder. Such Herculean portraiture is acknowledged by Dolabella to be appropriate to Antony, that most sovereign creature, and was also deployed in Holbein's paintings of Henry VIII, where he stands in that familiar posture of masculine assurance from classical sculpture. This is the Ditchley portrait. Geertz the Younger also depicts Elizabeth as a massive figure standing astride, albeit with a modicum of feminine decorum, over and upon a map of England in which the nation is shrunken to the dimensions of a hearth rug. In Antony and Cleopatra, such sovereign magnitude is ultimately fragile. When Octavius hears the news of Antony's death, he deploys the image of the earthquake shattered Colossus. The breaking, oops, the breaking of so great a thing should make a greater crack. The round world should have shook lions into civil streets and citizens to their dens. The truncated second line here is three syllables short, suggesting a dramatic pause after the onomatopoeic crack. The round world suggests the universal and cosmic implications of Antony's demise. This connotation is to be found also in Cleopatra's eulogy on Ant Antony. His face was as the heavens and therein struck a sun and moon. The relationship between the gigantic sun and moon and the diminutive little O is an image which has cultural and aesthetic significance as a problem of scale. The little O of the earth, some editors opt for the extra O creating a visual typographical analog to the relationship between the greater and the lesser. This line also refers to the proportions of physical reality that are necessarily reduced in the theater, lacking as it must the technical capacity to convey with mimetic conviction the story it tells in any medium other than language. A fact Shakespeare acknowledges in Henry V, of course, when the lofty fields of France are crammed into this wooden O. Robert Ollett's account of the Rhodes Colossus, which I quoted from earlier, appears in Witt's Theatre of the Little World, 1600, and has further bearing on the issue of scale, as it appears in Antony and Cleopatra. Quote, the ancient philosophers, courteous reader, have written of two worlds, the great and the lesser. The first is either universal, which Pliny and others have described, or particular, which is divided into heaven, called Mundus Archetypus, and earth, which Strabo, Pomponius Mela, and Solinius have set forth. The little world is man, so-called Aristotle, for whom the greater world was made. From this perspective, Antony is at once a giant and a microcosm, but in an important sense, not a man at all, but a pillar and a monument whose superhuman scale is destined to exceed mortal limits. In the architectural dimensions of the play, Antony, triple pillar of the world, is diminished, transformed into a 
trumpets into his trumpets full by a triple turned whore. Interestingly, excavations on the grounds of Nonsuch Palace, one of the locations in which Shakespeare's company performed for the court, instructions for building in, written in French read Troisième Pilier. Antony represents then not the essential elemental humanity of Lear, the thing itself, unaccommodated man, poor, bare, forked animal, but an image of humanity on the heroic scale, exaggerated essential to leggedness, supplemented by an extra dimension, which since it does not seem to situate him in the sphere of three-legged monstrosity, he is but one of the three pillars, must serve to locate him in the realm of the aesthetic. It was the human figure as microcosm, the cosmos in little, that was the foundation of architecture, and is alluded to again when toward the end of the play, Cleopatra threatens suicide. This mortal house I'll ruin, do Caesar what he can. In the Renaissance, the long-standing analogy between the human body and building was transformed into the scientific study of measurement and proportion by which works of architecture could be simulacra for the body. In De Architectura, Vitruvius noted that the body with outstretched limbs can describe a perfect circle or square, thus proving, quote, the body is so perfectly proportioned that it must stand as a basis for man's constructions, unquote. Proportion and scale thus become the architectural dimensions of power. From the beginning of the play, the statuesque Antony has been identified with a former and now lost stoic impregnability. Oh, sorry, I forgot, but that's Vitruvius. Um, those goodly eyes <clears throat> that o'er the files and musters of the war have glowed like plated Mars, now bend, now turn the office and devotion of their view upon a tawny front. Antony here becomes a kind of moving statue. His eyes now bend, now turn, like the supposedly miraculous statues that were, according to Protestant propaganda at least, rigged up in Catholic churches to impress the credulous. On board Pompey's galley, the inebriated triumvirs, three pillars, um, are uh, described from the perspective of the servants below them, are described as a massively unstable edifice of Roman power. Quote, some of the, their plants are so ill-rooted already, the least wind of the world will blow them down. Unquote. The high-coloured lepidus is ready to topple. To be called into a huge sphere and not to be seen to move it are the holes where the eyes should be, which pitifully disaster the cheeks. In this complex allusion to the concentric circles of Ptolemic astronomy, giantism here has descended from imposing classical man magnitude to become comic and grotesque. The holes where the eyes should be are like the cavities that sight steers to the Colossus explored as reported by Pliny the Elder, Elder, quote, where the limbs have broken off, enormous cavities yawn, while inside are seen great masses of rock with the weight of which the artist steadied it when he erected it, unquote. Shakespeare's The Holes Where the Eyes Should Be also resembles a grotesque by the book illustrator and painter Marcus Gerrits the Elder. The image breakers is an etching which was completed about 1566 in the wake of the Dutch iconoclastic riots. You might be able to see it a bit better here. Uh, the Dutch iconoclastic riots led Geertz to flee to England with his young son, Marcus Geertz the Younger. Although a Calvinist, many of Geertz's commissions were in Catholic churches, so he was between Scylla and Charybdis, vulnerable to both the iconoclasts and to the brutal Catholic response to the riots. In Amsterdam, a mob was incited to violence by the sight of fragments of statuary two merchants had brought with them from the destruction of Antwerp days earlier. In the image breakers at the bottom of the picture, Calvinists destroy religious artifacts, while the gigantic human head that is the picture's landscape, the vacancies of its or orifices, in the vacancies of its orifices, there are, it, it, are choked with Catholics. In the left eye socket, there is a wedding, 
and various monks lead apes about the hill of the head. The fragmented head, severed head of Gia's drawings impresses and horrifies even as a fragment. The servants on Pompey's barge use their humour to cut the triumvirs down to size. And throughout the play, we see political power tested by the fundamentally aesthetic and anti-aesthetic mechanisms of enlargement, disfiguration and diminution. Yet, of course, Antony's magnitude can only be glimpsed retrospectively in his disintegration. And we see him triple pillar when he does not have a leg to stand on in his dotage. In this condition, he is linked with his earlier description of Rome itself as a tottering edifice. Oops. Do I have my tottering edifice quote? No. Let Rome, let, let, let Rome in Tiber melt and the wide arch of the ranged empire fall. That tome, Roman Tiber melt uh, and this image of the archer are key, I think. Unaware that he is himself an arch because his legs bestride the ocean, the sense here is that of a structure supported by a vast arch, like a hall um, or a nave. The alternative would be to suppose the words imply an arch only, itself the empire, with Rome as keystone, and the extent on either side implied in ranged. This is the sense in which Shakespeare uses the word in Coriolanus. That is the way to lay the city flat, to bring the roof to the foundation and bury all, which yet distinctly ranges in heaps and piles of ruins. Range was an architectural term, meaning the stones of a structure whose parts were arranged in due succession. There are a number of religious associations here. The biblical idea that, uh, like Christ himself, the Gentiles constitute the stone which the builders rejected, that becomes the keystone of the kingdom of God upon earth. This was a popular topic for early modern homilists. In other words, Christians are not only living stones, but also spolia, like the, the rocks in the body of the Colossus. That is the rescued building materials which in Italy often meant decorative elements or marble rubble from classical buildings. Sir Henry Wooten's Elements of Architecture complains of, quote, an English error in making lime without any great choice of reuse stuff, unquote, which often meant an admixture of such inferior material that the stability of the buildings was significantly impaired. The, the line in Antony and Cleopatra let Rome entire uh, in time, the melt and the arch of the empire fall is also indebted to the reading for Rogation Week in the Book of Common Prayer. This week is directly related to the Roman festival of Rogablia, the spring festival of prayer and sacrifice after sowing. Richard Hooker's homily on Rogation Sunday expresses fear of what should happen if, quote, the order erected over our heads should loosen and dissolve itself, unquote. Like Shakespeare's image, Hooker envisaged cosmic, envisages cosmic disintegration as having a strong architectural dimension, the image of structural collapse. I imagine the congregation at St. Paul's looking nervously upward to the arches of the nave. In these inescapable associations with church architecture, it's worth remembering too that the dissolution of the monasteries referred not only to the dispersal of religious communities, but crucially to the dismantling of church architecture. In one of many such examples, John Stowe records that New Abbey was surrendered in 1539, quote, the said monastery being clean pulled down by Sir Arthur Darcy Knight and other, and is now a storehouse and bakery to serve their majesty's ships, unquote. So those are the arches of the empire. <clears throat> The arch is a bridge-like structure and straddles the Tiber just as the Colossus straddles Rhodes Harbour. In both André Tevez's Cosmographie d'Elements, and here we have that one, uh, and Van Heemskrieg's uh, images, the Colossus Enjambé appears to have a ship but somewhat painfully lodged in his groin. The arches of Trajan and Constantine set the precedent for the association of arch with empire. Triumphal arches were erected for James's accession 
and they are recorded in detail in Stephen Harrison, a joiner and architect in the Arch of Triumph, 1613. Crucially, England had achieved the status of empire when Henry VIII broke from Rome and thus acquired sovereign power over every aspect of English life, spiritual and temporal, and thus met the definition of an imperial monarchy. To conclude, it is of course entirely appropriate that Antony is like the Colossus, a pre-Greek Asiatic word which means statue, because as A.D. Nuttall wittily pointed out, there was a time when many Romans actually wished to be as like stone statues as possible. To be stoic is to be statue-like, impervious to emotional turbulence and the racked condition of being human. In contrast to Antony, Egypt's monuments, the pyramids, are the scene of Cleopatra's love affair, but they are never identified with her. It is Antony alone who occupies the realms of art and architecture, and his identification with the Colossus conforms to Shakespeare's renditions of visual art more generally, I would argue, which are preoccupied with the partial and the fragmentary. Like the many damaged, dispersed, and potentially impaired artifacts in the plays and poems, Shakespeare's depiction of Antony shows that the power of images, scattered, splintered, broken, ripped, reveals itself most fully in the energy of fragmentation. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And we'll come back to questions at the end. Um, so I'm just going to hand over now to Kartika Puri. Kartika is a doctoral student in the Department of Comparative Literature and Early Modern Studies at Yale University. She studies stylistics and rhetorical detail and the history of science as well, especially entomology and textile technologies. Thank you so much. Um, the, world of, the world of Hamlet, as Stephen Greenblatt has written, is shaped by radical uncertainty about purgatory this middle space of the realm of the dead. Primarily, Protestant theology of the 16th and the early 17th century discounted the belief that dead souls pass this undefined time and limbo that they pay any penitential price for fleshly sins. Yet the play's specter speaks as if he's a relic of this old Catholic doctrine. He tells Hamlet that he is, quote, doomed for a certain term to walk the night and for the day confined to fast and fires. Till the foul crimes done and day of nature are burnt and purged away, end quote. Hamlet responds with doubt. He wonders if the spectre is a spirit of health or a goblin doubt. But curiously, purgatory continues to flicker for the rest of the play between a material presence and an immaterial heresy. Today, I want to demonstrate how Hamlet the play um, uh, saturates purgatory with traces of materiality. Yet, far from confirming purgatory's material reality, these traces work to discredit the doctrine, pointing us away from a seemingly transcendental concept to an altogether, altogether more mundane materiality in a way that is entirely typical of the play. Think uh, the quote, imagination may trace the noble dust of Alexander till he find it stopping a bunghole. Or, just as a king may go a progress through the guts of a beggar, so does the play lead from mighty purgatory to mere pigment. In the process, it replaces a penitential universe with an ecological one, in which small insects rather than eschatological agents are the drivers of purgation. In Hamlet, sins committed on earth leave residual effects, stains and spots. The playwright implies that the flames and purgatory can burn away the tink. The tint, think again of the lines till the foul crimes done in day of nature are burnt and purged away. But as purging fails in his religious milieu, the stains persist. And to indicate the uh, failure of purging then, 
Shakespeare write that the stains are made from insect dust. Purgatory is a theological idea sanctioned in um, sanctioned in the late 13th century in Europe. The statement of the Second Council of Leon in 1274 of the Catholic Church explains, quote, if they try truly repentant, their souls are cleansed after death by purgatorical or purifying punishments, end quote. The dead daughters face purifying fires, um, purifying fires, uh, Thank you. A popular imagination and writings assume a purgatorious ignis as the punishment. Uh, the, the council, however, however, made no mention of purgatory as containing fire. Fire is also absent in declarations by the councils of Florence, that's 1431 to 1449, and of Trent, 1545 to 1563. Yet for the people, there is speculation based on scripture. Thou has proved my heart, sings the psalmist, and visited it by night. Thou has tried me by fire. In Hamlet, Shakespeare analogizes the purging fire to pyrotechny and alchemy, the traditions associated with laboratory processes and chemical color changes. Both are processes of refining transmutation. The process is twofold. Um, it unfolds over stage one of encountering stains and tinctures and stage two of their fiery removal. The analogy is that dross, the scum and taint when smelting metals, is being removed in a furnace. And that which fire does for the metal, God does for the soul, purifies it by separating it from stains and tinctures. Today, the method is that we look at three constellations of quotations. And to grasp how the play leads from purgatory to pigment, it is helpful to study first the cluster of alchemical illusions. In scene one act of act one, the trumpet waits the god of day, expels the ghastly night. Horatio explained how the specter disappeared. He says, and then it started like a guilty thing upon a fearful summons. I've heard the cock that is the trumpet to the morn doth with his lofty and shrill sounding throat awake the god of day. And at his warning, whether in sea or fire, earth or air, the extravagant and erring spirit hides to his confine and of the truth heron, the present object made probation. Medieval lapidaries associated the sun with sulfur, which is the principle of inflammability in alchemy. Lapidaries were these texts in verse or prose describing the process of refining precious and semi-precious stones. And in these works of gemology, the sun's rays smelt solid items, washing away their impurities. The present object makes probation. Marcellus develops Horatius' dialogue. The next stanza has parallel action, but the description is, of the disappearance is now religiously inflected. Marcel says, it faded on the crowing of the cock. Some day that ever gains the season comes where our savior's birth is celebrated. The bird of dawning singeth all night long. And then they say, no spirit dares to a prop. Marcellus's incipient fun transforms Horatius' god of the sun into the holy sun. Because of the interplay of homophones, now the Savior plays the sunbeam. In Matthew 3.16, Mark 1.10, Luke 3.32, John 1.32, what accompanies or recognizes Christ as a dove? And Mark Morrison explains in his book, Modern Alchemy, how in the medieval system of images and symbols, the dove represents the al alchemical stage of purification, of doing away with the stun the stains and impurities. In the scripture, Jesus, even more explicitly, is the alembic furnace. Proverb 17.3, for example, reads, the crucible is for refining silver and furnace is for coat. Likewise, the Lord tests the heart, and so on. This spectral encounter that Horatio speaks of and Marcellus expands records an act to scene two when Hamlet cites the story of Priam and Epirus. 
um, so named after the fiery, uh, a fiery pyre. However, in contrast with dove evolved with chasers, the ravens oversee Hamlet's action. At the beginning uh, of scene two, um, the cry of Corbite initiates the plan for vengeance. Hamlet says, come the croaking raven doth bellow for revenge. Raven writes, Morrison are the avian symbol associated with the initial alchemical stage when one encounters impurities and stains. Hamlet's myth, cited myth is like a, a condensed iteration of Act 1, Scene 1. The literary blason that catal uh, catalogues uh, Pierce's physical attributes is dense with the symbolism of the ghastly knight, which Hor uh, Horatio and Marcellus witnessed on the, uh, on the guard's platform. This knight settles at Pierce's complexion, who black as his purpose did the knight resemble. Shakespeare diction here reminds me of um, Nicholas Melchior's 1525 text, An Alchemical Mass, which was widely disseminated in the 1602 anthology, Theatrum Chemicum. Melchior was a 16th century alchemical writer in the text. He pictures the process of alchemy in the form of the Holy Mass, the primary liturgical rite in the Catholic Church. Michael Meyer, a physician and another alchemist, whose books were published in London, some dedicated to the head of the Royal College of uh, Physicians at the time, William Paddy, Maya engraves uh, Melchior on his knees at the altar, priest-like in Eucharistic vestments, raising in his hands as if saying the mass. Behind him is Mary suckling a child. In his alchemical mass, Melchior uses an anthropomorphic metaphor to describe the first stage in alchemy. It is, quote, the mighty Ethiopian, burned, calcined, discolored, altogether lifeless. Comparable to this pejorative racialized um, description is Shakespeare's darkened figure, Pyrrhus, who, with his um, dread and black complexion smeared like a painted tyrant, stood lifeless as the Ethiopian, using the uh, words from an alchemical mass. Uh, Pyrrhus, uh, like a neutral to his will and matter, did nothing. When we read Horatio's lines um, in Act 1, Scene 1, I mentioned how in medieval lapidaries the sun, and hence the god of day, could expel the ghastly night. But in the extract from Inis's Deal to Dido, we do not see the solar rays that burn away the dross of transgressions. Instead, we get an artificial explosion of Troy on fire the parching streets as a facsimile for the bird of dawn. Shakespeare replaces the sun and the holy sun with ephemeral firework structures to signal the inability of artificial flames to remove stains and tints of soul. Consider the cosmography of the play. Claudius says, give me the cup and let the kettle to the trumpet speak, the trumpet to the cannoneer without, the cannons to the heavens, the heaven to earth. He repeats the close of one line in the opening of the next. Repetition places the items like kettle, trumpet, cannon, heavens in an ordered series. Since the items of the series are presented as sharing the same attribute of speaking in different capacity, cannon and heavens appear to belong to St. James. Claudius is using the figure of Anadiplosus to indicate that the sky's, the sky's rumbling is but mortal pyrotechnics. In scene two of act one, he says again, but the great cannon to the clouds shall tell and the kings rouse the heaven shall root again, re-speaking, okay, thunder. In the very next dialogue, Hamlet phonetically recalls Claudius's canon, C A W O N, in his use of canon, C A N O N. He speaks, Oh, that this do to solid flesh would melt, pour, and resolve itself into a tube, or that the everlasting had not fixed his canon against himself slaughter. Evela um, the conjunction or connects the possibility of the melting flesh and the sin of suicide makes them um, substitutional. The second folio of Shakespeare's dramatic collection updates solid 
as solid, which means something state. This update and Hamlet's echo of Claudius allows the canon C A W N O N to expose a body to fire and highlight to vapor stew, which would calcine sin state. Ma Melchior's darkened figure in an alchemical mass had similarly asked to quote, be sprinkled with his down moisture and slowly calcine till he shall rise in glowing form from the fierce fire, unquote. In the myth of uh, Priam and Pyrrhus, this artificial sun doesn't cleanse, but further bakes and impaces uh, um, the flesh, making it resemble syphilitic skin. Pyrrhus is roasted in wrath and fire. A flaming top stoops to his base and with a hideous crash takes prisoner uh, Pyrrhus's ear. Then his eyes begin to resemble garnets. Shakespeare the Lapidarist, the gemologist, specifies that uh, Pyrrhus's eyes are like carbuncles, um, the gems in the shade of red. Oh. Even Pyrrhus's armor, made of uh, interlocking steel rings and plates of bass metal, is not gilded. Rather, the playwright writes that this, his surcoat is horridly tricked with blood of father's mother's daughter's son. Tricked is a method for indicating the tinctures, the colors used in coats of arms. Here, the hue of blood indicates gules, um, the heraldic tincture with the color red. In the story of Priam and Pyrrhus, purging fails, the red stains persist. In scene four of Act three, Act three, what Gertrude says to Hamlet evokes her readings of Paris. She says, thou hast turned my eyes into my very soul, and there I see such black and green spots as will not leave their tint. Green spots appears tautological. The denominal word made from the noun green also suggests round specks. Perhaps the playwright is phrasing something like spotted spots to emphasize the clothes pattern, but this quality of size and shape does not match the predicate in line 92. Leaving tinct is a chromic phenomenon. It would be a category mistake to think that a spot's roundness, its rotundity, could become discolored. Rather, etymology tells us that in the early modern period, the word had a specialized use in textile manufacturing, where many Western European um, languages called the dye stuff tree. The dye is a, red, uh, uh, is a rich red, a crimson. Dye is extracted from the dried pregnant body of small ins uh, scale insects called kermes. Um, these females produce pigmented carminic acid to deter predators, ally the insects are about the shape and size of a bee. They cling immobile to the evergreen oaks whose sap they feed on, and so attached, they appear like the seeds or the excrescence of the host tree. And for that reason, were assumed to be not a different organism, but the tree's cling. This fact gave the dye sap its common English name. Like Pyrrhus's arm, uh, like uh, where the surcoat is colored in blood red, green, writes uh, Pliny in, uh, in Natural History, is the dye reserved for the mil military costumes of our generals. Scarlet garments um, dyed with kermes are also mentioned in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word for the dye is salat shiny, or the worm that shines, considered the crimson worm of Psalm 22. Or the introductory oracles about purging Jerusalem in Isaiah 118. Um, Come now and let us uh, reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What Jehovah promises is that the sin of the past, deep dyed and green as it might be, can be restored to its original undyed whiteness. He promises this using the form of um, synonymous parallelism or bicolon, which invokes the repetition of one idea in successive lines to bring the opposed terms red and white into relief, like a jeweler's setting. 
Yet Gertrude is not white as snow. She broods her cloth like soul will take the crimson of sin and hold it fast. No amount of washing will ever remove any of its color characteristics. In the beginning, I mentioned how Protestant theology discounted the Catholic belief in purgatory. In 1521, the Catholic Church held a convocation called Diet of Worms. They summoned Luther to Worms. He refused to recount his 95 theses. Shakespeare alludes to this uh, scene. The alternative to purging of the dead uh, of the dead is Worms overtaking Polonius's decaying body, where he's eaten. A certain convocation of Worms are evident. Hamlet asserts that's the end. A similar alternative is the playwright's diverted use of the worm of the worm of the worm that shines to explain the changing religious circumstances. And uh, in fact, Bindiji in Thomas Middleton's, Middleton's Revenge's tragedy uses fastness properties to boast the lasting power of his thieves. This in Cray, I warrant it holds cult. In Act 1, Scene 5 of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, grain is the grammatical agent that carries the action of the verb endure, which means to sustain, to remain without yielding. This increase, sir, to endure wind and weather. In Plato's Republic, Socrates directly relates textile manufacturing to conservation. He and Glaucon are starting brave soldiers, and he mentioned another type of red dye insect to speak of there briefly. Shakespeare similarly imposes a sartorial idea of continuing to exist or having an effect for a long time on sins to foreground the failure of purging. As the universe of Hamlet repeatedly points us from a seemingly transcendental concept to an altogether more mundane materiality, her color fastness, conservation of dye replaces heaven's eternity, and small insects replace things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have this book there? Um, anyone have any questions at the back of that? I sent it Oh. Thank you both for your papers. It was uh, another really interesting session. Um, then I wanted to ask you uh, if we sort of work from the consensus that. Um, Julius Caesar precedes Antony Cleopatra by five or six years. Um, what is what are the implications of your reading of the colossal imagery? We sort of think about Shakespeare trying out how that works in Julius Caesar. Um, you know, with the uh, striding the, the narrow world like a, a colossus. Yeah. And and by implication, I suppose if you if you're suggesting that we always have to see that image as one, not in fact of monumentality, but of collapse and fragmentation and and decay. It's sort of the the uh, prolepsis, I suppose, in that moment of describing Caesar as a colossus, the inevitability that he will be fragmented, torn apart, and then we have Antony himself kind of describing Caesar's body as butchered, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the man with the, with the many holes in it, um, which seems a little bit like, uh, you know, the, the imagery of the sort of empty sockets and this fusion of, you know, eyes that weep and blood that, that you know, trickles from wounds. Um, it, it seems like a very sort of rich way of, of reading back onto Julius Caesar, the early Antony, who kind of revels in the, not revels in, but makes rhetorical, takes rhetorical advantage of the idea of the, of the colossal figure as one that is, is uh, um, you know, fragmented and, and destroyed. Um, so I wonder if you, could, if you could share some thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I don't have the quotation right at the top of my head, but the idea that, you know, we are between his legs and do peep about, the idea that you're looking from below, oops, in, in Julius Caesar. Oh, it's on. Okay, so the, the you know, in Julius Caesar, the, it's clearly that you're looking from below and, you know, peeping about um, the, this magnitude. 
Um, if somebody can remember the quotation completely, that would be wonderful. But the, it's very much like boy, and it's you know like boys who are you know between the legs of this great great statue. And it's actually very um, that passage. I'm absolutely sure is <clears throat> that Shakespeare derived it from um, one of the Lord Mayor's plays where the effigies of giants were used in ceremonial pr procession to celebrate London every year. And giants have a really important part in, you know, the history of Londinium because um, when Brutus came to found the city, uh, there was a race of giants. And in fact, uh, two of them stood outside City Hall and they are still carried in effigy. Um, Gog Magog, and what's the other one called? And Corrid Cornelius. Uh, they're the two sort of giants of London and they're paper giants. And there are accounts of boys, you know, trying to um, get under these giants and see who's really there and carrying them around. So I'm sure that image in Julius Caesar is from there. And it's uh, thinking about civic power in London as well as civic power in Rome. And I think the key connection is this matter of perspective. When the servants in Antony and Cleopatra uh, consider the drunken triumvirs, you know, they're looking from below with a critical eye. And the boys are also demystifying giantism. And, um, you know, there's another wonderful account of James um, coming through the country. And he gets afraid because he sees giants at a distance, but it turns out to be a group of fellas on stilts uh, who are poor petitioners, you know, who come and do obeisance to the king and it's all fine. But it's this quick, because they, they were far off. And so they looked like giants. This business about perspective and distance and whether you look from above or below, from near or, or far. I mean, I think that Shakespeare has that visual um those visual dimensions perpetually in mind, and that they uh, that they structure art and um, power, you know, on every in, on every kind of level. So that's how I was thinking about it. You, anything? Uh, have you? Have you? You sound like you've thought about it quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But this sense that you know we're like boys, we just peep about the, these these great figures. Um, that's uh, a less critical kind of uh, uh, view than than the, the actual boys in London, who are really like ah, these these giants. They're just paper. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but thinking about the and that you know it's very critical because uh, I mean I'm just simply saying that Cassius is there. Um, telling Brutus, you know, how dangerous um, Caesar is going to be. Yeah. So the criticism will we'll simply be like little boys, you know, peeping, and he is going to be the tyrant. And I think that uh, it is very interesting to compare the Colossus of Rhodes in Julius Caesar and in Antony, because uh, Cleopatra's, you know, um, elogious, you know, <laughs> vision of Antony is definitely not the use in Julius Caesar. No, but I think the thing is, yeah. it, you know, that you can bring him down. You can tear even even Caesar to pieces. Uh, and that, you know, I think the expression for the, those those gashes, somebody, who is it who says, you know, it's invagination, which is another kind of alarming sense of the apertures that are driven into his body. Um, anyway, I digress. Yeah, good points. Thank you. I uh, you know, one thing that really struck me, which I haven't thought about before, was this idea of people dying when their hearts crack. There's not an obvious reason why your heart should crack. Is that the Palanpo in the broken heart, as oh, well yeah. as the quote that you said there? And I wonder if you know your idea of the kind of architectural nature of man and man as the basis for architecture. If that's a kind of the sound of a building just before it collapses. Mm -hmm. uh, it just seemed really suggestive to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think they had a lot of experience of buildings collapses from what yeah. Wooten says and from, you know, knowing about destruction and from all the, you know, the legal things in London about wooden buildings. So with fire that they, sorry, that they crack and collapse. 
So I, and the, the kind of heart being, in a sense, the you know the the center of of the Vitruvian image of you know hum, human building of the body or whatever. Yeah, I'm sorry, to no bad. worries. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's no, on. <laughs> okay, I hope I, you could hear me anyway. I was thinking it is going to this very interesting point that uh, uh, well Caesar may collapse and Antony may collapse, but Rome is nowhere near collapsing, and then the audience obviously knew it. It's exactly the reverse, which goes with what you were saying, the relation between what is very fragile or small from a certain point of view also represents something which is much mightier and large. It's the beginning of the, the, the greatness of Rome. But also in the long, uh, in the long. But it's because you're speaking about yeah. in terms of architecture. Yeah, yeah. In the long scheme of things, I guess, you know, Roman power has diminished. Um, and there is this kind of recovery in Rome of, of monumental statues. I mean, during the period that Shakespeare's writing, which I think is interesting that from Depends what point of history you look at as to whether you think things are built up, built up rather than thrown down. And invariably, you know, I think as as um, uh, Robert Maiola has shown, whenever you mention Rome in the classical sense, invariably people think about Rome in the other sense, and that this this break from Rome, the Henry uh, effects, this fragmentation of England that gives it imperial status, that, that it's precisely this break that that endows it with this this grand news. It's a bit like Brexit, which was also a disaster. So, you know, um, well, yes, let's not get into that. But but uh, yeah, I think it's really very interesting that the way that the English are looking at classical magnitude, political, artistic, aesthetic, and, you know, always considering themselves in relation to it as an either an attenuated or diminished form, but with aspirations of, um, you know, achieving this grandeur, you know, I'm thinking about Ovid and Shakespeare and Mears and all those kinds of things you get in the literary scheme of things too. Yeah. But Rome, always big, always in the past. Um, you know, so there's always that image of magnitude, but, and potentially when it gets inflected with Catholicism, monstrosity, of the whore of Babylon, you know, there's that too. Well, still, the, the imperial Rome was not even built yet. No, no, that's right. But I meant. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's in the near future. Yeah. And it still remains. Yeah. Um, just a question for Katika. Thank you. Okay. Um, it did make me wonder, you're talking about black periods, if you've been thinking about Ian Smith's argument around kind of textuality and, um, you know, the materials that go up to make facial dyes and, and also the connection of the theatre industry with um, textile industries, um, with the starch industry that someone um, has been working on recently, whether, I mean, how practical are you going with some of these arguments? Are you trying to connect it to material practices around the theatre or not? Oh, oh that, that's really uh, useful. I, I hadn't gone there yet, uh, but that's an idea I would really like to pursue and the recommendation that you give. Um, there is something, um, something about literary production that is so material because I'm also thinking of um, uh, the how how Hamlet thinks of his imagination as produced in Wilkins. That quote in Hamlet as well. So there is something uh, that's so um, as a forged and um, molded. And um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a quite interesting point. I have a question for you as well, if I'm allowed. I just love this, um, this point you made about small insects rather than eschatological agents uh, can you know, purge that are the, you know, they're the purgatorial implements for, for Hamlet. And I just wondered if you'd expand on that, that why do you think that is, that that's the way it goes rather than, you know, heaven, hell, salvation? Um, I I think it's it's the tonality of the play uh, and how comes the question, uh, the kings and the beggar that, 
staff movement in Hamlet and the other quotation I was working with of Alexander and the bung hole. Oh, yeah. So I think that it, it's quite fitting with the tonality of um, of the play. But then there's also this literary history to think of insect ties as the most solid metaphor for something that remains. Um, um, so to think of long duration and conservation as something that is has been tied in cloth. Um, I this uh, so I, I'm I'm thinking about between these two things the, how the tonality kind of uh, renders um, this tradition ironical. Yeah, that's yeah. a wonderful point. Thank you. I have a question about the book that tricked, tricked the, the host moments. Yeah. And I didn't quite hear what you were saying about that. I was wondering if you could come back to that point because we've been speaking about tricks and devices, but I didn't know if it was any sort of, or if it was tricked in another sense in the quote. Yes, uh, tricked as a method for indicating the tinctures, the shades, the dyes used when making a coat of arms. So that process um, is referred as tricking of the circle code. Right, thank you. Thank you. If there's time for one short question, I have a question for Divna. That's actually a question for Rob. Um, when you quoted his face with us the heavens and there in Saka, Sun and Moon, which kept a course and lighted the little of the earth. Yeah. Um, and and where, I mean, the emendation that adds an extra O mm -hmm. makes the line extra metrical yeah. if you add to it Dola Bella's most sovereign creature, which yeah. interrupts Cleopatra. So I, I was wondering in terms of the aesthetics of fragmentation, which you started with as opposed to that of the detail, because the detail is still part of the whole, to know you, whereas the fragment is a lost part, is a part of a lost whole. So I was wondering how you would um, link your analysis of fragments and details to this particular passage about that extra metrical emendation of O, shortened form of O, for yeah. referring to, to the wooden. Yeah, wall. I mean, it's an, it's, it's it's an editorial choice, but I think it raises all the things that you just said. I think all of those possibilities are, are in play. Um, and um, I, I also, I guess, the the OO, you know, <laughs> it's the, as we learned yesterday, it's the sound of tragedy. Uh, so I think that that's in part why it's, it's um, relevant in there. Um, and I think this business about dimension is really significant. So that if you're a reader, I don't know how it would play in the in the theatre. I'm also interested in the in the truncated line, of, you know, of crack. I think that's also kind of interesting. But there's another form when you talked about the fragment. I, I love this. The fragment is something that's a broken off part, but not necessarily. Sometimes. Um, you know, a fragment in, in modernity in Nocklin's art historical view, the, the fragment is um, a hole that's had something knocked off it rather than part that's taken from a hole. And then there's another concept in the Renaissance, which is the non finito, which is something that's unfinished, which is a kind of a, a fragment. And I think the the thing about, the, and I, you know, I was thinking there with, Hermione, like, oh, even Hermione, big statue, but the painting's not dry. She's non finito. But the um, with the O's, there is a sort of completion in the word, in the syllable. And so if you repeat it, you insist upon that plenitude, that lack of being fragmented, if you like. Does that make any sense? I'm just BSing off the top of my head on that one, but let's give it a go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we should probably end it there. But thank you so much to our speakers. Lots thank of you. details to follow up.
Alchemy is always so um, fascinating to me. I've never looked at it. I think it's so complicated. It is. Um, yeah, and uh, also just like the theological, um, the theological impetus behind thinking of purifying yourself and bettering yourself as uh, as a pure metal, a beat metal. I was thinking about about truth with discipline, and I shall be made true as well. Yes, you know, yeah. all those sort of weird things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, this, I hate to do this because, it's, uh, but, but I have a chapter that might be of interest to in the last book on specifically being tincture and being tainted in Hamlet, like the Recluse and Comedy of Errors, because there's a there's a great moment in Comedy of Errors when Adriana says, um, you know. It, it, it's, she thinks her husband was cheating on her, it's the wrong guy, but um, she says, if you